Hey guys, today we're setting up Niagara water footstep effects, including jumping. Hey guys, welcome to today's episode, and today we're taking our first step into Niagara. If you're not familiar with Niagara, it's Unreal Engine's relatively new special effects system. The goal of this episode is to wrap up our series on footstep effects. This is the last episode in a chain. If you haven't checked out the previous episodes that are on footstep sounds, I highly recommend it because we're building off of that blueprint setup today. But by the end of the episode today, we're gonna have a completely functional, ready to go footstep setup. Everything from sounds to effects across your entire game. And that also includes jump landing, so jumping into water. And we're not just covering the basics of Niagara today because we're actually passing data based basically how deep the water is from our blueprint into the Niagara system, and that's gonna determine the size of the splash. So you're gonna know how to dynamically update a Niagara system by the end of this episode. Now, when we get into the details today, if you're familiar with any of the new features in Unreal Engine 5, you might be thinking to yourself, why isn't he using the new Niagara Fluids plugin? And I tried it out with footstep effects, I just like the free out of the box pack instead. So that's what we're going to use. But we're going to get into the brand new Niagara Fluid plugin in about three episodes, so stay tuned. So the content pack that we're using today for our Niagara footstep effects is called Niagara Footstep VFX. It's 100% free and very easy to get. You just gotta open the Epic Games Launcher, navigate to the Marketplace tab, and search for Niagara Footstep VFX. Add it to your cart, check out, and you got it for free. And then on the Library tab, go into your vault, find the Niagara Footstep VFX pack, just click Add to Project and select the project you want to add it to. When you open that project, you'll get a prompt in the bottom right-hand corner to import changes to source content. Just say yes to that prompt and you're all ready to go. So we got a few new concepts this episode, but really it's revolving around the basics of Niagara. The only thing that's somewhat advanced is user exposed parameters, which is the variables that we're passing into the Niagara system, and that's gonna drive exactly how many particles are we spawning when the player either jumps into the water or a footstep lands in the water. So let's get to it. So in our last episode, we set up footstep sounds for water. So we've already done the heavy lifting and figuring out, for example, what material are we stepping on? How deep is the water? So we're gonna build on all of that setup in this episode. So to start, let's navigate into the folder of the new content pack we just downloaded. So if you get the A surface footstep folder, and then in that go into Niagara FX and then particle systems. So in here, we've got a ton of emitters and we also have Niagara systems down below. And the two that we're gonna be working with are the PSN Water Heavy and Water Light, the very last two here. So go into the Water Heavy. And if you zoom out a little bit, then you'll see the emitters and the system over here. And right away, it's already playing over and over. You can get a sense of that just by zooming into it. And I'm just gonna pause that right about there. That's perfect. So you can see some of the bubbles and this water mist. And so how are these generated? So we're gonna go into a lot of detail on the settings in the emitters, but focusing mainly on the settings that I find useful to be able to change or know at least what they do. But right now, just the basics. So we have our overall system here, we have each of our emitters, and each of our three emitters is emitting a different kind of particle. And so this is our water drops, this is the water mist splash that gives it kind of that cloudy effect. And then the last one is our water waves. And those are the waves that you see right here next to the bubbles. So before we do anything else, let's just get this Niagara system working with our footsteps. So if we go back to the content drawer, go back to our content folder. So two episodes ago, we created our blueprint function library for footstep effects. Now it's gonna have other kinds of effects too, but they're all under this pawn human folder because I wanted a library specifically for human effects. But eventually we could use this for other creatures, other characters in our game. So if we double click into that, and if you navigate over to your jump land water splash sound, and that's what we set up specifically last episode. So in this function, I basically have different tiers where depending on the depth of the water, it's playing a different sound. So the first thing let's do is let's get a jump land effect going for every single one of these tiers. So the way I'm gonna do that is we're gonna drag off a pin and I'm just gonna spawn Niagara system or spawn system at location. And that's roughly the equivalent of playing a sound at a location, but now we're spawning a Niagara system. But what's our location? Well, we already have our sound location, so let's just get that, hook that up. And what's our system? Well, that's what we were just looking at, PSN Water Heavy. So there we go. I'm just gonna hook this up to the other sizes just so we can test this out. Compile, save. Moment of truth. And there's the effect. But I'm already seeing some issues here, right? So one is it seems to be triggering a little bit earlier than the sound. 
The other thing is it's always the same size, right? So it's not adjusting based on the depth of the water at that location. So we're gonna take care of the delay first and then we'll go from there. So the third asset that we're gonna need this episode is our animation blueprint, just like last episode. So I'm just gonna navigate to my content drawer, back to my core folder. I have mine here, but wherever your animation blueprint is, just go into that. So on our event graph here, the other thing we set up last episode is every tick, if the player's in air, this is assessing whether or not to play a jump land sound. And it's assessing whether or not they hit water. And if they're about to hit water, it plays here. And if they're not, it plays down here. So the main thing I want to do here is I want to set the Niagara system to play with a very slight delay relative to the sound. Because the sound, you know, typically it takes about maybe a tenth of a second to really get going. So what I want to do is I want to put in a delay of about a tenth of a second between when the sound starts and when the effect actually happens. And then I think they're going to match up. So I'm going to move these two nodes out a little bit. And basically we're going to split this delay into two separate delays. So this one's going to be 0.4 seconds. And then here I'm just going to do another delay of about 0.1 seconds. And here is where I want the Niagara system to play. But I don't want to play it right here, right? Because I want to be able to use this on any human character. So if we go back to our blueprint function library, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to delete out this and I'm going to duplicate the jump land water splash sound function. And instead, we're going to have jump land water splash effect. So I'll right click, duplicate, effect. And so instead of playing sounds for this function, we're going to spawn Niagara systems. So drag off a pin, spawn Niagara system at location. I can delete out this and I'll just hook up our sound location right there. And it's PSN water heavy. The other thing I'm going to do is just change some of these variables. So sound location, I'm just going to change the name of this to splash location. And that's our local variable. And then our input over here, I'm just going to make that also splash location. Oh, I can't make that identical. So let's say splash effect location. And here I'm just going to duplicate this about four or five times for every one of these nodes. And the only two that are going to be different are these two down here where the water is very shallow. So for those, that's going to be PSN water light. So let's delete out all of our sounds now. Connect these all up. So now that we got this jump land water splash effect function up and running, how do we reference that in our third person blueprint? So I can just search for jump land here and we've got our jump land water splash effect and connect that up. But just like for sounds, we got to pass in some variables, right? And here's the thing. So 0.1 seconds ago, that's when we did the footsteps fear trace by channel. This is actually hitting the ground that's underneath the water. And then here we got our actual water hit. And because there's that 0.1 second delay, the location of the hit is inevitably going to be a little bit different depending on the direction of the jump. And so what I want to do is I'm going to do another one of these profile traces 0.1 seconds later. And I think that's safe to do because every time you do a line trace, it's really not too performance intensive. And then I can hook up this to the splash effect location is water hook that up. And then for the water depth, well, we got to do some math there, right? So we can get this location break and we can get the location of this and we're going to break that. But basically what we're doing is we're getting the location of the trace to the water. And then we're also getting the location of the trace to the ground underneath the water. And that's figuring out the depth and the difference between those really we're focused on the Z because that's the height. The difference is the depth. So I can subtract that one from this and that's going to be our water depth. And in that function, we're not doing anything different based on our depth yet, but we are going to. But let's just test this out right now. I'll compile and save our animation blueprint. Here we go. So that's looking pretty good in terms of the delay, right? The only problem I'm seeing is the jump effect seems to be originating a little bit in front of the player. So we got to put it right square in the center of their center of gravity. So let's do that now. So if I go into the line trace function that we created last episode, so I'll go into that. And what we did last episode is we made those line traces about 30 units forward, about 30 centimeters. And the reason we did that is because a footstep, typically it's about, you know, a third of a meter forward, about a foot forward every time you take a footstep. But in this case, I don't want to do that because we're using it for the jump land effects for water. Now for our other functions, for our sphere traces, those I'm going to keep 30 forward because those we're using for footsteps. But for our line traces by profile, those I'm just going to make zero here. And I'm also going to do the same thing for Y. 
and that's going to put it right center in the player and do the same thing for the right. Although I don't think we're using the right function right now, but maybe in the future. So now the effect is originating right smack in the center of the player. Perfect. And the timing seems pretty good too. And I'm just going to highlight this, hit C, and say controls splash effect. 0.1 second delay. All right, so what's remaining to set up? Well, we haven't covered Niagara at all, so let's get into that. Because really the problem that we're trying to solve, the remaining problem is based on the depth of the water or based on jumping or a regular footstep, how intense should that splash be? So the very first thing I wanna do before we start messing around with all the settings in the Niagara system is I'd like to make a few duplicates of the two systems that we're using. Whenever I'm messing around, it's always a good idea to have a pristine copy that we can always refer back to. So let's go into the content drawer, back to content. We'll create a new folder, right click new folder. I'm gonna call this Niagara. Within Niagara, I'm gonna have another new folder called impact effects. And we're not just gonna have water, so we're gonna have other types of impact effects, but let's start with water. So a folder in that, I'm just gonna make that blue. And so now if I go into a surface footstep over here into our Niagara effects particle systems, and what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna drag in water heavy into water, copy there, same with water light into water, copy there. And I'm gonna rename this one rename water splash largest underscore Niagara system NS and then this one same thing so rename water splash smallest underscore NS and I'm going to close out of this one so I don't mix it up and we're going to go into the largest but I do want to create another copy of this so we're going to duplicate and this one is going to be with variables underscore NS and this is what we're gonna actually modify depending on the water depth. But let's start with our base one here, water splash largest underscore NS. So zoom out again. All right, now an overview of Niagara systems. So every Niagara system always has this blue system stack with some system parameters. We're gonna come back to this in just a moment. But they also have one or more emitters and the emitters are what actually emit particles. And the reason that this one has three separate emitters is as we saw, there are three separate types of particles that are being emitted. So if I go back to the beginning, I hit play. So we've got some mist there, we've got some water bubbles, and we also have kind of the waves of water. And those are those three. And if you actually wanna see the particle, if you wanna get down into it, that's what's called the sprite. And you can go down to the render, sprite renderer, and there's a material that's generating the actual particle. If I double click into that material, and there's actually four of them here. We're gonna come back to that in just a moment. I'll talk about that. So this is the child material, go into the parent. And so the parent is doing all sorts of crazy stuff. So we have a mask here, and then we have our normal map here. It's kind of giving it the watery texture and a lot of other fancy stuff that luckily we don't need to figure out. So we're just gonna use that as is and close out of that. But what's neat about this is there's four separate bubbles in one material and it's able to handle that because down here in the sub UV, it's basically saying, okay, this image is actually two by two, meaning there's four particles. There's one here, there, da, da. And over in our cloud in the mist here, if I go to that sprite render, it's even more. So that's actually eight by eight. And you see that right here, 64 total clouds. And that's just to give it some variation for each sprite that's rendered because you don't want every single particle in the particle system looking exactly identical. Now let's go through a lot of these core settings. So at the very top of the emitter, we have whether or not it's a CPU simulation or a GPU simulation. The key difference here is GPU, it's gonna run a lot smoother, a lot faster. The problem is GPU has some limitations, but almost always, if we can set it to GPU, we want to because it's gonna be far less performance intensive. The GPU is designed for stuff like this, special effects. Now we get this warning here that we need to have fixed bounds, just check that checkbox and we're all set. And I'm gonna do that for all three of our emitters here. And then we go on to our emitter update stuff. We have an emitter state, life cycle mode. And so it says the second line there, allowing the owning system to calculate life cycle and pass those values down to child emitters is a significant optimization in most cases. So these are the child emitters. This is the system as a whole here. Now the system is set to loop infinitely. Typically what I do is I set this to just once because an effect typically is just one effect. There are exceptions to this, right? So if you have fire, you know, the fire's just gonna go and go and go and go. So in that case, you do want it to be infinite. 
but in this case, it's a one-time thing. So I'm going to set the system loop behavior once, the loop is five seconds, and then over here in each of our emitters, what I'm going to do is just emitter state, I'm going to change the lifecycle mode to system, and then it's using everything in our main system here. Now, it's probably not that big of a deal here. It's probably not that big of a performance improvement, but I still think it's good practice. So we're going to change that for each of these over to system. And then we get into the spawn burst instantaneous. And this is actually where the particles are spawned, are generated. And it's not always the case that the particles are spawned in a burst, but typically for things like an explosion or an impact, yeah, it's suddenly like boom. But in our next episode with the fountain, it's gonna be a steady stream of particles. And here in our top right, we got our spawn count of 10. And spawn time, that just means they're all instantaneous. And for our mist in the middle, that's got a spawn count of three, this one's about five. And now I played with these settings quite a bit. And for our largest splash, I think we can up this by about 15, which is a lot, but the fact that we put it on the GPU makes the performance a lot better. So I'm gonna increase the spawn count to 150. Over here, this one I'm gonna to increase to 20. And the last one, I'm gonna increase that to 75. And let's just give this a whirl here, play. Yeah, it's a big splash now. And one thing you'll notice is because we got rid of the infinite loop there, we just have to drag this over to the start and then we can start it again. Let's keep going through these settings though. So we have our particle spawn. So all of these are initiated just once when that particle is initialized. And then when those particles are initialized, exactly where are they initialized? So they're initialized in a sphere and the sphere radius of 15. I played with this a little bit, maybe making the splash bigger, but in general, I found this setting to actually be pretty good. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna scale up the entire system, and then that's what's actually gonna make the splash a more realistic size. And then when the particles are initiated, what happens to them? So immediately, velocity is added. And we see here that our minimum to our maximum, the X varies quite a bit. The Y is the velocity left and right, so it makes sense that those are equal, but why is this number different than this? And that's because we're using local space here. So local space is the space in relation to the camera in this case. So the negative 350, that's in the direction towards the camera, and the 200, that's away from the camera. So why it's doing that is because it's making the effect look larger, closer to the camera, which is kind of a neat way of scaling up the system without actually producing more particles. So we're not gonna mess with that. And the Z of course is the height, so that's all upwards, but some particles will just have a little bit of velocity upwards and then others will have quite a bit of velocity. So that gives it a generalized effect. Now down into our particle update. So these are things that occur on every single particle, every single tick. So every single frame of our game. So the first thing is update the age of the particle. So we've got kill particles when lifetime has elapsed. So the particles will just die, disappear, be destroyed when their lifetime has elapsed. And the lifetime is based on the initialized particle that's right up here. But then every single tick, we have a gravity force applied. So you see that there, not gonna mess with that drag force, so that's like the air, the air dragging and slowing down particles in space. So these are all settings like gravity and drag that you can experiment with. You can just play with those and see what kind of effect it has. The sprite size scale, this is an interesting one because you see the sprite over the course of the lifetime, it actually gets a little bit bigger and then it gets smaller. So what happens over its life cycle is it gets a little bit bigger very quickly and then it shrinks down to nothing. And so by the time it disappears, you don't even notice disappearing because it's already much smaller. And the other thing that they're doing here is the color. So you notice that it becomes more and more transparent with time. And that's the alpha, that's the transparency. So those are a lot of the key emitter settings that you'll find in your typical Niagara system. But now, how can we change, how can we alter the size and scale of the system depending on how deep the water is? Because that's the real problem that we're trying to solve here. So the first thing is, I just want to show you, you can scale up the system directly in the blueprint, directly in the function in this case. So right here, we could say, okay, we're gonna make everything in the system a little bit larger. So I'm gonna make it about three times size. And what I found is on average, if I make the large system about three times size and the smaller one about twice, it looks pretty good. But also we gotta switch out our systems here, right? With the new one. So if I search for water, and then I can get our water splash largest. But here's the thing, before you do this for every single one of these nodes here, we can actually simplify this function quite a bit. And the reason for that is if the water is very deep, then it's always gonna have the biggest splash, right? We're always gonna have this largest splash. But if the water's between very deep and very shallow, that's where we're gonna alter the system based on how deep the water is at that location. And the way we're gonna do that is we're actually gonna send data, we're gonna send a variable from this blueprint here into the Niagara system to do it. 
And because of that, we don't need separate systems at each of these tiers. We could just use a single system and send the data. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to delete out all of this, aside from this very last node. And we're going to have one single tier here where if the depth of water is above, let's say, 10. So if it's anything more than very shallow, it's going to use that new system that we created. And then I'm going to hook up this one down here. This is going to be our water light. So if I search for water splash and our smallest and hook that up and make sure your scale for that one is two by two by two. And then this one, instead of water heavy, if I search for water splash and it's going to be with variables. In this one, we're not using the with variables because in really deep water, it's always going to be the biggest splash. So we'll just keep that right as is. And so now, how do we pass the data of how deep the water is into our Niagara system and have that actually change how many particles are spawned? And this is actually beyond beginner Niagara stuff. I would say this is intermediate, but we're going to do it anyway. So let's go into our water splash with variables Niagara system, and that's where we're going to do this. And I'm just going to pause the system here. So one thing I didn't talk about is this parameters tab over here. And all of these parameters, so we've got system attributes, we have emitter attributes if you select an emitter, and we also have particle attributes. Think of these as all the variables, all the data that's defining how the system actually operates in real time. And in this case, it's the emitter and the particles for that specific emitter. But what's neat about this is we can also have our own user exposed variables. And so I'm going to create my own. So plus sign and we're going to make new and under common. So we have float, we have int. Now, the problem is our water depth is a float, right? It could be 72.3 centimeters deep, but we can't spawn 72.3 particles. We need an integer for that. So I'm going to choose an integer here. And then in our blueprint, we're going to transition a float over to an integer. And I'll show you how to do that. So if we choose in 32, I'm going to call this number of particles and make sure that this is one word and remember what you type in here verbatim because we're going to need it when we go back over to our blueprint. But before we go back to our blueprint, how do we use this variable to update each of the emitters here? So if I go to our spawn burst instantaneous, so instead of 10, we could tie the number of particles variable here to this. And it's really simple. All we need to do is drag and drop it right in. And so now the number of particles that are spawned for this emitter is going to be whatever this variable is set to. And that's exactly what we're going to do in our blueprint. But let's do the other two first. So the other two are a little bit trickier because if you go to spawn burst instantaneous here, this is only three. The other one was 10 and this is three. Now we can set it to be the same, but the problem is I don't want the same number of particles here. I want it to be roughly one third of whatever this is. Instead of setting this to a number and instead of setting it to the variable directly, I can just select the drop down here. Under dynamic inputs, we can divide an int. And what we're dividing is the number of particles and I can just divide it by three and that's going to be set there. And for this one, this is five. So the original was 10. So for this, I'm going to do the same thing, but we're going to divide by two. So under the drop down dynamic inputs, divide int, this is going to be divided by two and I'll drag in my number of particles right there. Now, the other thing that I forgot to do here is we just got to adjust these all to GPU sim and make sure when you do that, just select the fixed bounds checkbox. And then the other thing is instead of self and once, let's do system. And over here in our system, let's set it instead of infinite, let's set it to just be once. So now we have our variable, we're passing that variable into each of the emitters, and that's going to determine how many are actually spawned in the spawn burst instantaneous there. But the question still remains, how do we get data into this variable in the Niagara system? So if we go back to our blueprint function library, the way we're going to do that is we're going to update a variable from this return value right here. But actually, we're not going to do it for this one because this one is the static one. It's unchanging. This one down here is going to be based on the depth of the water. So I can drag off a pin from return value and I can search for variable and I can set a Niagara variable in 32 and we got to get the name of our variable, right? So I'm going to go back into it and that was number of particles, number of particles. Make sure it's spelled exactly. There have been several times where I just got spelling slightly wrong and it doesn't work and I'm pulling my hair out like what's going on. So we have to tell it how many particles do we want to spawn. And you heard me say earlier that that's going to be based on the depth of the water. But the problem is over here, we've got our depth of water in float and we need an integer to pass into this. So how do we do that? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a brand new local variable. I'm just going to call it number of particles. And this one is going to be an integer, not integer 64, just a regular integer. 
And I'm also going to make some space here because what I'm going to do, drag out this reroute node, I'm going to connect up the number of particles directly to the depth of water here. So if we connect this, connect this, and then directly there, boom. So we can truncate a float. And what that does is it basically cuts off the decimal point, And that sets the integer to be whatever the whole number of the float is. And so now that we've got that local variable, I can just plug that in. So I can drag in a reference, get, and we'll plug that right in. The other thing I'm going to do here just to test this out is I'm going to do a print string. So we're just going to print and I'm going to print the number of particles. And that way I can compare in real time. I can see how many particles are spawning, like how that looks visually. And in the top left corner of our screen when we're playing, we can see exactly how many particles are generated. Compile and save. So make sure your scales are updated. Make sure the right system is here, the one with variables. Make sure that's what you updated here with our user exposed variable. And we are good to test. And if you look in the top left corner, we got 112, 112, 88, 40. Yep, smaller, a little bit smaller splash. So that's looking pretty good to me. But if you wanted to reduce the total number of particles that are generating, what you could do is you could actually divide this by two or divide it by like 1.5. And that would give it slightly fewer particles. So let's actually try that. I'll divide this. Let's divide it by like 1.5. And that will go into the truncate. Just going to make a little bit more space here. Yeah, so I like that a little bit better. Not quite as crazy. Yeah, I saw a high at 78 there. 80. Yeah, that's a little bit better, I think. Maybe I crank this up even a little bit higher. Let's do 1.7. And so now I can just delete out the print string, and we are all set for our jump landing. But the one piece of this that we still got is for our footsteps, right? And so what I'll do is I'll just duplicate this function and we'll go from there. And this is going to be footstep water splash effect. And with footsteps, we just have a couple of things to set here a little bit differently. So instead of 1.7, I'm going to divide by 3. That's going to reduce the effect quite a bit because a footstep is not nearly as large of an impact as landing like a full jump in the water. And the other thing is for footsteps. So if it's really deep water, I actually don't even want an effect. And because I want to have the player's waist as a threshold, basically, if the depth of the water is anywhere above wherever their waist is, I don't want any splash whatsoever. So instead of this being just above 10, I'm going to set this to be a little bit more controlled of a threshold. So it's also going to be less than, let's do less than or equal to 60. So it has to be both greater than 10 and less than or equal to 60. So how do we make sure both of these are true? So I can do an and statement. And whenever you have an and Boolean, it just means both Booleans need to be true in order for the overall condition to be true. So basically, if the water depth is between 10 and 60, and only in that case, then it's going to spawn a system allocation. But the problem is, as our build currently stands, if this number is, let's say, 70, then this is going to be false. It's going to come down here, and it's going to do a little splash. I don't want any splash if the water level is above the waist. So we just need to have one more branch. So I'm going to copy this branch node. And I'm going to hook this up to the true, and I'll hook this up here, move this out a little bit. And what we need to evaluate here is whether or not this is less than or equal to 10. So less than or equal to 10 centimeters. So we'll get our depth of water, and then we just got to make sure it's less than or equal to 10. And if that's true, then we spawn our little system right here. And I thought about also making the little system change based on the number of variables similar to this. I don't think we need to do that, though, because it's already a small splash. All right, so now that we got our footstep function set up, we've got to hook it up into our third person blueprint. Just make sure you compile and save. We'll go over there. We'll come down to our footstep functions here. So we've got our left foot and our right foot. So for these, I'm just going to drag this out a little bit. And the top area here, this is where we have our water effects. So I'm just going to search for footstep water splash effect. And I'll connect that up. Then I'll connect up this reroute node. This is our water depth. And this right here is the trace hit. And last but not least, we've got our impact location all the way over there. And we'll do the same thing with our right foot. And if you want to set up this entire process from scratch, that's two episodes ago. Episode 19 is where we started. Final test, compile and save. And one last tip I highly recommend is whenever you're dealing with Niagara systems, make sure to check your FPS. Because if you don't design a Niagara system properly, your FPS could really suffer. Yeah, so we're looking at about, let's say, 43, 44 frames per second, 45. So I saw it dip to about 40 there. So it's about a 3 FPS dip. But 
so far doing pretty well. And now we test our footsteps. Yep. And if we're below the waterline, no footsteps. Nice. But one thing I'm noticing is that the effect seems a little bit large for the footsteps. I think for jumping it's totally fine, but let's adjust that for our footsteps. So if we go back to the human character BFL, and if we go into our footstep water splash effect, I'm just going to change the scale there to be normal. So one, one, one. And same with this one down here. One, one, one. Let's do one final test, and away we go. So now our footsteps. Yeah, much better, right? So the system itself seems pretty small. We get a little bit of a splash going there. And the other thing that I might end up doing is I might actually reduce the overall velocity of the water. Because you see there it's kind of exploding outwards. I got to think about that. I might duplicate the system and then just reduce the velocity of the water in all regards. But something to consider. So to wrap this up, I just want to go through some of the optimizations that I did through extensive testing. And I figure instead of building this with you, it's better to just show you because a lot of it's kind of all over the place. So the first thing is I was thinking about situations where the player might be plummeting down to the water or really any character for that matter. And based on the speed that they're going during the fall, it doesn't make sense for that splash to always be the same size regardless of how fast the player is going. And so there's this essential movement data called velocity that's doing exactly that. And let me just print this out and show you what that looks like. So as I'm falling here, you're seeing it in the bottom left hand corner. It goes up to Z equals 4000. And so based on that velocity, based on the speed of falling, I can adjust how many particles are spawned during the event. And so the way we're doing that is I'm also passing in our velocity. And the reason I have this temporary falling velocity variable is because what I found is that by the time the splash effect actually plays, because of that 0.1 second delay, the velocity could be reduced down to zero because you could have actually hit the ground underneath the water already. And so what I'm doing here is I'm storing our velocity in a temporary falling velocity variable right here before the delay. And to do that, all I did was I created a new variable here. I named it temporary falling velocity, made it a vector, and I also sorted that under essential movement data so that it's part of those variables. The key is it has to be before the delay so you get the full effect of the falling. And so now when I pass this velocity into the jump land water splash effect, let me show you that. And so from the velocity vector here, I get the vector length and I store a float variable called velocity. And so getting the vector length is very simple. You just get vector length. And then based on this float, I've got an equation. And this took some finagling. But I figured, OK, velocity can be a maximum of 4,000. So I divide that by 2,000. And then I multiply that by the number of particles. But first, I had to transfer this number of particles from an integer to float. And so if I just search for two float, that's how I can convert it. But through some playing around, I realized that at a minimum, I wanted 10 particles. So even if the velocity of a fall is like almost nothing, meaning the player is just going boop, boop, then it still should have at least 10 particles here. And then I truncate that in order to make a float. And I made sure to clamp that at 150. So in case the player is somehow falling at like a speed of 10,000 or something, I don't want that to be some obscene number. So those were the velocity changes. So let's watch this fall right here. Yeah, pretty big splash. And then what I realized is if the player is still walking under the water and they jump, I don't want to splash unless they actually go above the water surface. And so let me demonstrate this, how I set this up. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to select this spline point. I'm just going to make that a little bit deeper. Let's make that 600. And that's going to allow us to test this out. All right, our velocity goes to 4,000. Boom, big splash. But then if I jump, nothing, no splash whatsoever. Basically, I got to get to the point where a jump will actually put my head above water. And then there's a splash. So how did I do that? Back in the animation blueprint, I created a brand new function, very simple function. All it does is it's an underwater check. And so what I did is I took our footstep line trace by profile left. I duplicated that function if I go into underwater check here. And that's starting a line trace by profile at 150 down to 100. So this is about head level. This is about half a meter above the player's head. And all it's returning is whether or not it's hitting water. And then I put that function directly after the footstep line trace by profile left. So basically it checks here. Is the player underwater? If true, it does absolutely nothing. And then only a false does it go on and do its thing. 
Now there's a couple other things I ended up doing. I ended up duplicating the footsteps fear trace by channel into short and long. And the reason for that is I found that as the players in shallow water, if they're jumping or they're walking, that often the effect would play too quickly because there's a little bit more height between the water level and where the player's actually hitting. So the way I set this up is it first does a short sphere trace by channel. And if that has a hit, it just goes straight into the splash effect here. But if it doesn't have a hit because that's a very short, it just waits another 0.1 seconds. And then it does a longer sphere trace. And then it does the same splash effect. So all I did was I duplicated all this and I made this an extra 0.1 seconds. I reduced this down to 0.3. And for our short function here, let me just show you that. So that only goes down 140 units. But for our long, so that goes down 220 units. And what I'll do for the final part of this, I realize that it's difficult to follow all of this logic. So I'm just gonna go through the entire event graph and you can track all of this, make sure you've got it. So I'm gonna delete out this print string here. So right after we confirm is falling, this is gonna be connected up. Activated jump land effects goes in the footstep line trace by profile left. Then it does the underwater check if this returns that it's water. Only if the underwater check is false, then it does the long check here. It plays the splash sound based on the depth of the water, activates jump land effects. And remember, this is the variable that we have from last episode that just prevents the jump land effects from going every single tick because that's assessed right here at the front. Then I set that temporary falling velocity variable and then there's the 0.1 second delay. Then we do a short line trace because if the water's right there, I wanna go right into the sound. So if that's true, then I also do a line trace by profile left and this gets where the water level is. I subtract that from the ground level here and that gets our splash effect water depth. And I also pass in our temporary falling velocity. I'll also go back into every function just to show you those. Then there's a 0.4 second delay and we unselect activated jump land effects. And then that way the next jump effect can go into effect 0.4 seconds from now. This whole thing can repeat after 0.4 seconds. So if this is false, then we're using the footsteps fear trace by channel left short and then we do the jump land sound and the reason we're doing the short one here is because that's only going down to the footstep and if we did the long one then the player could still be above the ground and it would hit the ground and play a sound even before the footstep actually hits the ground because all this down here this is when jumping on land and then we do the same half second delay but up here it's split and then over here if we don't get a hit when we're doing a sphere trace short then we wanna do an additional 0.1 second delay because that's where the water level is pretty close to the ground and we need a little bit more delay to play the effect at the appropriate time. And then we have both traces repeated again to get a more accurate location after the 0.1 second delay. And then that location is what's passed in the jump land splash effect along with the water depth and our temporary falling velocity. Then we do another delay of 0.3 seconds. The full delay always adds up to 0.5 seconds. We just split it up in various ways. So then let's go over the functions really quick, starting with the left long. So here's our two transform locations. Here's trace by channel right. Here's trace by profile. This actually hits the water, this one. And that's left, and this is right. And then this is the trace by channel left short. And then here's our underwater check. And that starts z equals 150 to z equals 100. So back in our blueprint function library, I already showed you this for our jump land water splash effect. That determines number of particles. Now, if I go over to the footstep water splash effect, there's one other thing I did here. I added an additional input for this of movement speed, and then that gets set as a local variable of velocity. And the reason for that is I noticed when I'm in deep water and I've adjusted the player's speed so that their legs aren't moving as fast because they're in deep water, the splashes were still pretty large. And that didn't make sense if the speed is slow. So I wanted to make sure that the splashes accurately reflected the speed of the player. And so I have a little equation here to do that. So it divides velocity by 100, it subtracts 3, multiplies that by the number of particles, and that sets the number of particles. And all of this is for our footstep water splash effect. And then back on the event graph of our third person character animation blueprint. So I'm just passing in ground speed directly into there for movement speed. Same thing we did for the footstep water splash sound from last episode. Just make sure you get that for both the left and for the right down here. The very last thing guys, so all of this up here, this big mess, so we can't collapse it down to a function and I'll show you why, collapse the function. Nope, can't do it, failed. And that's because all of these delay nodes we got in here, you can't have delays and functions. But if you remember back to episode five, we covered the difference between functions and macros. And so what we can do is we could select all of this, 
right click and we can collapse it to a macro. And this is a lot, but temporarily, I think this is what I'm going to do. So I'm going to rename the macro jump land sound and effects. If I go into that macro, yeah, we've got this giant thing here. And the last thing that I want to do, I think coming out of the macro is I want to connect up all of our execution pins to the output. And what that's going to do is it's going to allow us to have additional functionality after this. So if you have execution pins going into the output, those three, then if I go back to our event graph, yeah, so now I can actually do something after the fact. And that's one of the benefits to macros is you can have delay nodes. Now, probably I'll end up cleaning this up a little bit, but do this as the very, very last step. Once you're confident, everything's working. And then that way you don't have to go in and mess with it again. One very, very last addendum, guys, and I really apologize for having all these updates, but just do more testing and realize certain things. So what I ended up doing was I got rid of the delay node at the front here, which was 0.1 seconds, because really the problem wasn't the jumping out of water. It was the jumping back in. So I needed to add an additional 0.1 seconds onto the end of this. So if this path is taken, the whole thing is 0.6 second delay as opposed to this one, which is 0.5. And that's the difference between jumping in shallow water down here and jumping in deep water. So let me just show you one final test of everything. So plunging into the water. And then over to shallow water. And now the jumping in the shallow water is synchronized. So that concludes today's episode, guys. And that also concludes this series on footstep sound and effects, the last three episodes. And in our next episode, we're diving into Niagara in earnest. We're putting together this standalone fountain system that you see here. But we're also doing something in Niagara that's pretty new, brand new, actually. So Niagara can now do GPU ray trace collisions. And so what this means is we can have a system here with literally thousands of particles with completely accurate collision. So if I zoom into my character's very shiny head here, yeah, we see on one side of his head, all the particles just kind of bouncing or gently trickling off. So we're going to set all of this up next episode, and I hope to see you there.